Hi, my name is Stella Slebeckian. Today we will discuss a broad and fundamental concern in the practice of medical science, and that is the question of the quality of evidence that makes up the scientific base. I know that this whole online seminar setup can be somewhat unusual, so let me introduce myself to make it a little less weird. I'm an associate professor of epidemiology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Currently, though, I'm on leave from my academic position and I work as a genetic epidemiologist at a Silicon Valley company called 23andMe. My research focuses on both genetic and environmental contributions to disease, and I also spend a lot of time thinking more generally about evidence and some other questions that we will cover today. The big question that we will begin to answer is this. When is research evidence good enough to change the practice of medicine? The answer to this question is relevant both to the medical scientists that are running studies that produce such evidence, and some of you, much like myself, are in that category. But it is also just as, if not more, relevant to the clinicians consuming the evidence and making decisions that impact patients' health. Of course, this question is so enormously fundamental that one seminar is probably not enough to even scratch the surface of it. But my goal today is to get you to just start thinking critically about what you read in medical literature and share some best practices for design and interpretation of your own studies. We will start by exploring some recent trends in medicine and science related publications. A lot of us, myself included, grew up in this world where if something was published in a medical journal, it was trustworthy and you could make clinical decisions based on that information. The world has changed, and in this case, maybe not for the better. You know, in English, we have a proverb, all that glitters is not gold. Unfortunately, I do not know if there's an Armenian equivalent, but I can tell you that all that's published is also not gold, and I'll show you some examples of why. After we discuss some of the problems that have been emerging in the publications world, we will also cover some ways in which you could set up your own studies to answer your own research questions in a rigorous way. Then I will share a few insights on the most common logical fallacies that I and other editors have seen in medical literature. We'll talk about their potential consequences and how we can avoid them. Finally, at the end, I'll share a list of resources and you could use those to further explore any of these topics. As I said, this is a really rich and broad topic and it's hard to do justice in just one session. But what we can do is lay the groundwork for future critical thinking. As promised, first I will show you what's been going on in the scientific literature world in the past couple of decades. And this applies to all signs, but for obvious reasons, the stakes are much higher for medicine. And for that reason, some of these trends have been downright dangerous. On the left, we have a graph, and you can see that there's a pretty sharp increase in the number of scientific publications over the past couple of decades, since about 2000. At first glance, this is really good, right? There's so many people who are working in medical science, they must be creating new knowledge and coming up with discoveries. It's hard to think that this is not a positive development. But the question we have to ask juxtaposes quantity and quality. Do all of these 2 million articles that are published every year represent valid contributions to science? There are two pillars on which the scientific publication system rests. One is peer review, where independent experts in the field critique and review the work to make sure that it's strong. And the other one is reproducibility. We trust results more if they have been compellingly reported more than once. Of course, there are other criteria, but these two are really critical. And in recent years, they have faced some challenges. One such challenge came from the emergence of predatory publishers, and those are entire publishing houses that are interested purely in profit rather than science or rigor or advancement. They will literally publish anything, and I really mean anything, I'll show you some examples, as long as the authors or their universities are willing to pay the publication fees. The numbers on this slide attest to the rise of this phenomenon, and those refer to publishers. Each of those publishers can have hundreds of independent publications and journals. 
So needless to say, the evidence that's published in these journals is notoriously unreliable. That's a pretty strong claim, right? So how do we know it's that unreliable? Well, there have been multiple interesting and tragically comedic investigations that have illustrated that. For example, two years ago, a scientist under the pseudonym Neuroskeptic has submitted this absolutely nonsense paper about something called midichlorians, which are, as you can see here, fictional entities which live inside cells and give Jedi their powers in Star Wars. It sounds kind of like mitochondria, and apparently what this neuroskeptic did was copy the Wikipedia entry about mitochondria, edit and repackage it just slightly, and then submitted it to a bunch of journals that were known to be in this predatory category. The article was complete garbage. It was filled with other Star Wars references. Even the names of the authors referred to George Lucas, who in reality was the director of the film, and Anakin, who is one of the main characters. It was a complete charade, and this parody of a scientific paper was rejected by three of those journals, but two asked to revise and resubmit, and four journals accepted it right away. One of them even asked this fictional George Lucas author to serve on their editorial board. This story is really funny, but it's hardly alone. And if you just Google predatory journals sting, you will uncover many more examples like this one. Now, there is this unfortunate stereotype going around that people who submit and publish in these predatory journals are all scientists from developing countries where maybe the tradition of scientific rigor is not that strong, maybe there are not so many resources to carry out proper studies, so people resort to publication by any means necessary. And what these predatory journals do is offer a really easy way to accomplish that. But this data show that that's not uniformly true. While the dubious honor of publishing the most articles in predatory journals does go to India, the second worst offender is actually the United States. As an American scientist, I find that deeply disturbing, and I think we should be held accountable just as much as other countries. This is certainly a problem that affects scientists globally, regardless of where their institutions land on the socioeconomic spectrum. And I can tell you why that is too. My entire academic career is judged on the quantity of publications. It is very often, not always, but way too often, quantity over quality. In American academia, there is a saying, publish or perish, because people who do not publish enough do not keep their jobs. It becomes a matter of professional survival to publish, and many people take this unfortunate shortcut that's offered by predatory journals. It also tells you that just because a paper was written by someone from a high-income country, from a top university, that can afford to produce good science, it still does not mean that the paper is any good. More generally, how can you tell that a journal is predatory? I can tell you that over the course of my career, I have published over 100 articles. None of them were published in predatory journals, and all of them, except for one, have been accepted only after substantial revisions. For some of them, I had to actually revise more than once. And that experience is typical, especially for good journals. Real journals take a long time, they ask a lot of questions, and they make you really work for that publication. I can tell you that the vast majority of these revisions made my work better. And I'm not alone when I say that I'm grateful for that process. It made my science better. But in contrast, predatory journals just offer you the red carpet. They try to make publication as easy as possible without pesky revisions or rejections. And really, they do not have high standards, as the Star Wars example shows. Not only do they accept anything that you send to them, but sometimes they will actively email you and try to get you to send them articles. Let me show you an example. So here's one of many that I have received over the years. In fact, so many 
that my email algorithm has learned to recognize them as spam, but sometimes they sneak through. There are several signs here that tell me that this is not a serious publication. Number one, the journal has nothing to do with my area of expertise. Its title contains references to genetics and microbiology. I do work in genetics, but I'm a statistical geneticist or genetic epidemiologist, if you will. I've never in my life done anything in microbiology. So it's suspicious that of all people, they're emailing me. Number two, the grammar leaves much to be desired and the spelling and punctuation are inconsistent. The whole email looks like an eighth grader wrote it. Number three is this one line right here. All types of manuscripts are welcome. That is not serious. You need to have focus. Otherwise, you end up publishing Star Wars stuff. Finally, there are no links to other issues of this journal, no website, no title for this person who is supposedly inviting me to submit a paper. And in general, it looks really unprofessional. I was especially interested in this claim when they said all NIH funded articles will be indexed in PubMed. Now that's something that applies to me. My work happens to be NIH funded and being indexed in PubMed, which is a good database of scientific publications is a good thing for my career. But you can probably already tell where I'm going with this. After getting that email, I went to PubMed and I typed in the name of the journal to see if they really do index their publications. The result is a big fat zero and what the email promised is patently not true. There's another database called Medline, which is even more rigorous. Sometimes you have suboptimal stuff that slips through the cracks into PubMed, but if it's in PubMed and Medline, then you can feel more confident of its quality. Needless to say, this journal is not in Medline either. Finally, please know that Google Scholar, which is another commonly used database, indexes everything, so there's no quality control whatsoever. And if you have a journal that's bragging about being indexed in Google Scholar, that is by no means an indicator of quality, and that should be treated as a red flag. So this leads to the logical question. Okay, so we know that not all journals are created equal. So what can we do when we are trying to choose where to publish our work? There's actually a pretty good database of known predatory journals that I have included here on the slide, but it's an archive. So it doesn't include any of the new ones. And we already know that new ones emerge every month, if not every week. So use your judgment. If you want to make sure your work reaches a wide international audience, be sure that the journal that you're submitting to can be found in PubMed and even better if it's both PubMed and Medline. Finally, if you have really compelling work and if you want to find the journal where it would be seen and cited by a lot of colleagues, you can look up the journal's impact factor. The impact factor is by no means a perfect metric. It's just a function of how often the article in a given journal gets cited, but what it does is it gives you an idea of the journal's reputation. Really the best advice I can give anyone here is to use common sense. If you suspect a journal is garbage and predatory, it probably is. Trust your judgment when you read other people's articles and when you decide where to send your own. So let's talk about your own articles. Let's take a step away from publications and take a high level overview of the types of studies that you might be using to answer your own research questions. Study design is really important for a variety of reasons, but in the context of this lecture on evidence, I want to focus on the proper interpretation of evidence that arises from different types of studies. Contrary to what you might hear, I don't think one design is better than the other. What matters is choosing the design that's appropriate for your research question. Not everybody would agree with me on that. And very often you see figures such as this one, where the strength of evidence is somehow arranged from weakest to strongest. And that's what the arrow represents. But usually at the bottom, you have some sort of descriptive studies that simply quantify how much disease there is in a specific sample, or in this case, they're talking about animal model research. 
And at the top, you usually have randomized clinical trials or meta-analyses of randomized clinical trials. Very often, people refer to randomized clinical trials or RCTs as the gold standard of evidence. But we already talked about gold. Yeah, not all that glitters is gold. What I will do next is introduce the pros and cons of the commonly used study designs and suggest some good use cases for each of those. Let's start with this so-called gold standard of the randomized clinical trial. These studies have been around since biblical times, actually, and the earliest account I could find was described in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel was considered to be a prophet, and he was a Jewish captive among the Babylonians. The king offered them a feast, and Daniel and his friends refused to accept that food. Instead, what he did was he made a deal with the king's official that they were going to give just plain vegetables to one group of people and the king's food to another group of people and compare their well-being after 10 days. He was probably worried about poisoning. What happened? Well, that depends on whether we choose to view the Old Testament as reliable evidence. But the passage says at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's rich food. So if we consider that to be the first clinical trial, it actually wasn't a very good one. Why not? Well, it was missing the three elements that we rely on in modern times to be able to generate good evidence. It was not randomized. And because of that, the people who got the vegetables may have been very different from the people who got the king's food. So the difference at the end of 10 days would have been because of what made them different in the first place, not because of the diet. It was also not controlled. So we could not see what would happen over time in absence of any intervention, just because of secular trends alone. And over 10 days, that's probably not a big deal, but it is in studies that last many, many years. There was no placebo, so all participants knew exactly what they were getting without any blinding. So there may have been subtle effects derived from expectations rather than physiological reality. And finally, the king and his officials knew who was getting which intervention, and that could also bias interpretation of the dietary effects. These concepts of randomization, blinding, and placebo control, if they're implemented properly, can help us ensure that the effect of the intervention can actually be causally attributed to the intervention. For the many, many mathematical details that inform causal effect estimation in trials and otherwise, I would highly recommend this book written by one of my professors, and currently it is available for free on the Harvard website. You can follow the link on the slide. But if you do have random allocation of treatment or randomization, if you do have placebo control, and neither the patient nor the physician know if they're getting or giving treatment or placebo, you might be able to draw some pretty robust conclusions. And that could have been the end of this part of my seminar, if not for the fact that in the vast majority of cases, a trial like that is not possible. It may be impossible for reasons of ethics, a classical example of that is a study that wants to evaluate exposure to some toxic chemical during pregnancy. That would be morally wrong and against international scientific and legal norms to subject pregnant women to something that we believe to be harmful. So we cannot study the effects of this chemical using this so-called gold standard design. Trials may also not be feasible because of cost or timing. In general, trials are very expensive and for treatments with small effects, you would have to recruit hundreds, if not thousands, of participants. It also could be that you're studying something that does not result in consequences until several decades later, and by then your career is over. There are many other issues with trials, and one that I mentioned here is non-differential loss to follow-up. So what does that mean? Well, for example, people who are sicker to begin with may find it difficult to come to all the trial appointments, so they drop out of your study, and you end up with an unrepresentative population because the sickest are excluded, and that biases your estimates. So, you know, trials can be pretty great, but they're not for everything. 
So what do you do when you cannot have a trial? Sometimes you might have something we call natural experiments. So for example, in 1989, my home state of California implemented stricter tobacco control policies. And what we can do is compare incidents of smoking related disease before and after this policy change using certain assumptions that are quite similar to those that we use in clinical trials. And we can estimate the causal effect of smoking on these conditions in that framework. That does work nicely for some research questions, but for others, you would have to wait a long time until this kind of opportunity to do a natural experiment presents itself. More commonly, we would go to the second option on that list and conduct an observational study. The distinguishing feature of observational studies, as you can see here on this slide, is that the investigator does not manipulate the participants in any way. There's no treatment, there's just observation of people's exposures and diagnoses, usually over a pretty long period of time. Observational studies are a lot more common than trials or other experiments because in many ways they're much easier and you have to worry a lot less about ethics. On this slide I listed several common types of observational studies and the arrow roughly corresponds to the strength of the evidence. You have prospective cohorts at the top and ecologic studies on the bottom. Now I will provide a very high level overview of these designs and suggest some ways when each could be appropriate. The most rigorous and the most expensive type of observational study is a prospective cohort. In such a study, we recruit individuals that are healthy at present time. We measure their exposures and lifestyle factors that we think might be interested. And we then follow them for a long time to see what kind of diseases they develop. One famous example is the nurse's health study. It invited over 100,000 American nurses to participate in a study of chronic diseases measured all kinds of factors, most importantly their diet, and looked at how these factors at baseline could predict incidence of various chronic diseases early on. That study actually created most of what we know about food and its relationship to disease, although of course it's not without its caveats. Another type of a cohort study is retrospective. For many conditions that we might be interested in, it takes many years, if not decades, for the etiology to unfold itself. And many investigators, and certainly the patients, want the answers now. But what if you had reliable information on exposure from the past, and you know who was or who was not exposed with a high degree of certainty? Then you could just see how healthy or sick they are now. Your exposure has to have been recorded a long time ago. The classic example of this study is quite tragic. Let's say we're interested in the health effect of the atomic bomb. Certainly we cannot do a randomized experiment for that. But what we can do is take a group of surviving individuals who were around Hiroshima in 1945, because the exposure of the atomic bomb can be pretty reliably ascertained. And we can compare their health outcomes to individuals from other parts of Japan who were alive at the time, but not exposed to the bomb. And in both prospective and retrospective cohort studies, you need to make sure that the exposure really did happen before the outcome did. Why do I say that? Well, if you look at both exposure and outcome at the same time, you very often find paradoxical results that are due to this phenomenon called reverse causation. For example, I'm currently working on a project that is looking at health effects of red meat consumption. So things like beef, lamb, and pork. I was fully expecting to see that people with a colon cancer diagnosis also had higher red meat consumption because we do know that red meat, particularly grilled red meat, is a fairly robust risk factor for colon cancer. But in our data set, when you looked at both red meat in the diet and cancer at the same time, we actually found that cancer cases ate less meat. And why is that? Well, it's because the moment a person is diagnosed with something like that, they stop eating red meat because they've read all those newspaper articles about how red meat is bad for cancer. So you need to know what came first, the disease or the risk factor that you're studying. And for that, cohorts are a very good study design. There are some other advantages. You have the ability to look at many different outcomes and at rare exposures. 
because at baseline in the beginning you can make sure that you enroll enough exposed people and recruit your participants accordingly. And we know that no study design is perfect. The biggest problem with cohort studies, I already mentioned it, is how expensive they are. And especially for prospective cohorts, they can take a really long time. They're also not great if you're studying rare diseases because at baseline, you cannot ensure that you will have enough cases of some uncommon condition at the end of your follow-up. And finally, just like with trials, people might drop out differentially with respect to their disease status. Again, it's that phenomenon of the sick people not being able to make their study appointments, and that could bias your risk estimates at the end. So if these cons of cohort studies are a deal breaker for you, and particularly if you are interested in rare conditions, you may wish to consider case control studies. In this paradigm, Instead of enrolling exposed and unexposed individuals and following them for a long time to figure out if they would develop the disease, instead you enroll people who you know already have the disease. Those are the cases. And then people who came from the same source population but do not have the disease. And those are your controls. And then you compare their odds of various exposures. This design is really common in oncology, particularly for rare cancers. So you would enroll your cancer cases at the hospital, and as controls, you may select individuals from the same hospital, but who are there for reasons that are not related to cancer. For example, they may have recently had a myocardial infarction. Because they're at the same hospital, they come from fairly comparable populations. And to even further improve the accuracy of your estimates, you can even match them on age and sex. And of course, you would need to make sure that your controls do not have cancer, whether diagnosed or undiagnosed. These types of comparisons of cases and controls are very efficient and they're much less expensive. Because the outcome already happened, you also do not have to wait a long time to ascertain it. And we already established that for rare diseases, it's probably the best design there is. But of course, they come with their own reservations. You might introduce bias when selecting controls if they're not representative of the population that gave rise to the cases. You might also introduce bias when you're gathering information on exposures. An example of that would be that pregnant women who had bad birth outcomes tend to remember their pregnancy exposures much better than controls because they spent a lot of time thinking about what could have gone wrong during their pregnancy to produce a bad outcome. Because of this, differential recollection that's related to disease risk, you also end up with biased estimates. The final point I would like to make on case control studies, which are very common in epidemiologic literature, is that you can only estimate odds rather than incidence or absolute risk. And in cohort studies, you can estimate all of those things. So that's something to think about when you choose a study design. Then we have cross-sectional studies. In this case, we're ascertaining the exposure and the outcome at the same time, like a snapshot. An example would be NHANES, which is a big nutrition survey that takes place in the United States every couple years. NHANES measures people's diets, but also their weight, their waist circumference, and other health status variables. And then investigators test for associations between what people eat and what they look like and what their health is like. Because both diet and weight are measured at the same time, it is hard to figure out what came first, what's causing what. It's possible that you have a very heavy person who is eating quite little because they went on a diet a few months ago. Again, this is an example of reverse causation. Or maybe you have a heavy person who is eating a lot because they always eat a lot. You cannot say which way the direction flows simply from this one snapshot of data. All you can establish here are prevalences and correlations. For some research questions, it's perfectly fine because it's an efficient way to measure a lot of things about a population. And knowing the prevalence of certain conditions can help you allocate resources, so it can be quite helpful. On this slide, I included a diagram that compares the timing of the three types of observational studies that we have discussed so far, because they can be confusing and sound quite similar, but really what differentiates them is time. So take your time to figure that out. 
The final type of study I would like to discuss today are ecological studies. And they're quite similar to cross-sectional studies because you ascertain exposure and outcome at the same time. But instead of doing it for each individual, like you would do in the previous type of study, you do it aggregately. So you do it for the whole country or the whole county or the whole city. So here's a very old canonical example of an ecological study. And you can see it's old because it includes countries that no longer exist, like we have East Germany and Yugoslavia. And the reason I had to use an old example is because these days people largely stay away from ecologic studies. This particular one correlates how much red meat the country consumes and their rates of colon cancer among women. At first glance, this looks like a really compelling relationship. But of course, you do not know if it's the same people who are eating the red meat and also getting cancer. You can imagine a scenario, for example, that in some countries, women eat a lot less meat than men. And if you're correlating cancer rates from only women, which is the case here, and red meat consumption from everybody, women and men, you will not get an accurate picture of this association. This phenomenon of assuming that aggregate trends hold for individuals is called the ecological fallacy. And that's the reason why these studies are not very popular. But what they can be good for is generating new hypotheses that then you could take and test in a cohort study or a case control study. So the take home message from this section of the seminar is that all study designs, when they're executed properly, have a purpose. But you need to know which design best fits your question. This was a very short introduction that left out some hybrid designs, but I hope it stoked your curiosity enough to explore more. So here is a pyramid of evidence that's similar to the one that we saw before, but it adds a few more layers here. And more importantly, it lists public databases that you can use on your own to explore each type of study. In the penultimate section of this seminar, we will discuss a couple of common logical fallacies that threaten proper interpretation of evidence from the types of studies that we just talked about. We have already mentioned some of them, particularly the ecologic fallacy or the issue of reverse causation, but there are a few more that I would like to highlight today because of how often we see them in published research. And it's useful to both recognize it and to not repeat those kinds of fallacies. The first one might appear to be very common sense to you. You'll think it's very obvious, but I promise there's a nuance to it at the end. This fallacy is called correlation is not causation. And what it means is that just because we see a statistically significant association between A and B, it does not follow that A causes B. It could be because B actually causes A, like in the scenario of reverse causation. But more commonly, it's something like this. Imagine that you did a study and you found a statistically significant relationship between coffee consumption and the risk of lung cancer. Many news outlets jump on the findings and they start publishing headlines like coffee causes lung cancer. But the more likely explanation is very simple. What do people often do when they drink coffee? They often smoke cigarettes. Now, it's not everybody, it's not all the time, but in many countries, there is a clear statistical relationship between cigarettes and coffee consumption. And of course, we know that smoking does cause lung cancer. In this case, smoking is an example of a confounder, and this type of picture is a much better representation of the underlying causal relationship. For the sake of this example, I'm oversimplifying a lot of things but it nicely illustrates the principle of correlation not being equal to causation. It should be common sense, but it's not yet de rigueur in some medical or epidemiologic studies. I did promise you a nuance about this fallacy, and here it is. We all know that correlation is not causation. And because of that, some articles err on the side of never claiming causation at all, especially if they have an observational study. Many of us were actually taught that you can only use the word causal when you talk about randomized trials because that's the only setting where you can truly estimate unconfounded causal effects. Well, if we want to get technical, 
estimates from trials are not necessarily that great and perfect and unconfounded either. So what do we do? Do we never get to talk about causal relationships? Then what's the point of doing the kind of research that we do? The article that I referenced on this slide, and it is freely available, I highly recommend that you read it. The main point of that article is that if we always run away from the causal terminology, we often end up misinterpreting findings because there's some methods that explicitly estimate causal effects and they warrant that kind of language. If you're estimating causal effects, you should say that. Other methods only estimate associations and that's, of course, where we would not want to claim causal effects. Most importantly, this article also advises on how we can ask better causal questions and avoid a lot of this kind of confusion. Again, the article is available for free and I highly recommend that you spend some time digesting these arguments for the sake of better methodology and better evidence. The next fallacy I would like to discuss is as follows. Humans are hardwired to consistently underestimate the role of chance in explaining their findings. Part of it has to do with our evolutionary heritage because humans in general are not very good at dealing with uncertainty and that's why many of us are bad at statistics. But what I would like you to remember is that chance is absolutely always a possible explanation for your findings. Even if your p-value is tiny and your effect size is enormous, you must never discount the role of chance. You always have to keep it as a possible explanation for what you observe. There are two popular science books that I recommend on this topic. And one of them is The Black Swan, which was written by an economist about highly improbable but not impossible events. And the other one is called The Drunkard's Walk, which is a reference to a statistical method. And it was written by a theoretical physicist, but in a very accessible manner. I hope that these books can help you think through those concepts such as p-values and statistical significance. And what does that really mean? And what do your findings really mean? One specific example of underestimating the role of chance that I see very often has to do with not correcting for multiple hypotheses. When you're testing several hypotheses at a time, and in my field of genetics, we often test million hypotheses at a time because that's how many genetic variants we can quantify. Just by chance alone, some results will appear significant even though they're really not. So what you have to do is correct for multiple hypotheses. The easiest method is shown here on the slide and that's called the Bonferroni correction. You take your statistical significance threshold, usually that's 0.05, and you divide it by the number of tests that you're conducting. So if you have millions of them, you divide it by several million. There are other methods that are less conservative, but whatever method you use, you need to actively control for the number of hypotheses that you're testing. Otherwise, you will end up with false positive findings. That is illustrated on the right in this graph. This is a simulation of a scenario with no real effects. And you can see that in the top chart, without correcting for multiple comparisons, you can get one, two, three, four, even five positive findings simply by chance where there should be zero findings. After you implement such a correction, you might get one but in general, your chance of false positives is much, much lower. It's not zero, but it's much lower. And to make sure that your finding is not a false positive, the next thing to do would be to also test it in an independent data set to ensure reproducibility. The last logical fallacy that I would like to cover today is referred to as the prosecutor's fallacy because it's just as common in the court of law as it is in biomedical science. Simply put, some people think that the probability of A given B is the same as the probability of B given A. Mathematically, that is incorrect because the relationship between these two probabilities is summarized correctly by Bayes' rule at the bottom of this slide, and it's a little bit more complicated, as you can see. But let me explain this to you in plain English. This is the fallacy that says that because we know that, for example, women of advanced maternal age have a much higher probability of a fetus with Down syndrome, that means that if we have a Down syndrome diagnosis, the mother is more likely to be older. And in fact, when we look at the numbers, the mother is more likely to be younger, simply because more younger women give birth. <laughs> 
This and some other examples are nicely illustrated in a short and also freely available article that was written by my colleague Dan Westridge. It also contains information on some exceptions to that rule that are quite narrow. And this is essential reading if you want to properly understand sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, and other metrics of interest in clinical medicine as well as public health. So today we discussed several interesting issues that pertain to scientific rigor and interpretation. And this was by no means an exhaustive list of logical fallacies or of study designs or of threats to good practice of science. Each of these topics on their own likely deserves its own course, not just one seminar. And that's why throughout this video, I have included many references to other people's articles and books, so you can explore it at greater depth should you be so inclined. I would like to finish by recommending just a few more resources. Here, the asterisk means that the resource is free and you can just find it online. For example, Ben Goldacre is a Scottish physician and he thinks about those issues of evidence a lot. He has an excellent blog and a viral TED talk. You could easily locate those with a Google search. He also has a book. Unfortunately, it's not free, but it is readable and quite pertinent. Another book examines these issues at a more systemic level, and it was written by an American science correspondent, Richard Harris. It asks such questions as why animal model findings often do not apply to humans, why we haven't cured neurodegenerative diseases yet, and so on and so forth. A good book. Third on my list is a free article by John Anitas, and he's a preeminent scholar of scientific rigor. He's here at Stanford University. And that article really deals with this issue of false positives. In this case, it has a provocative title, why most published research findings are false, but it's justified. And finally, even though I have already mentioned it, I want to recommend again Miguel Hernan's free textbook on causal inference. It nicely sets up the framework for us to ask the right questions and choose the right methods. And for that reason, it's very valuable. I'm also available via email listed here if you're interested in these topics or if you would like to follow up with questions. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have enjoyed this brief excursion into the science of evidence.